Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. We thank you, Lord, that it contains all things necessary unto salvation. And so, Father, we ask as we gather here uh, this morning that your Spirit's presence would be made known in our midst, that the same Spirit would open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our minds to understand, that we would honor you um, as we learn from you, and we would honor you as we leave here today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we're continuing our summer sermon series, Faith That Works. One commentator suggests that the entire book of James can be viewed as an exposition of what real faith is all about. He says that it provides a series of tests that reveals the true nature of our faith. And so in chapter 1, as we've already seen, there is the test of enduring the trials of life, the test of resisting temptation, and the test of how we respond to God's Word. Last week, in the first part of chapter 2, we looked at the test of how we treat other people. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the test of how we respond to the needs of others. If we look ahead, uh, chapter 3 looks at the test of our tongue and the test of wisdom. Chapter 4 deals with our attitudes towards the world and one another. And chapter 5 ends with the test of prayer. All of these areas, all of these chapters, all of these tests reveal what's inside of us. Uh, They can reveal to us the true nature of our faith. And as the title of this series suggests, for James, it's all about having a faith that works, a real faith, a real faith that is lived out in a real world. In contrast, in our reading this morning, James is confronting the kind of faith that doesn't work, the kind of faith that is empty, uh, that's fruitless, that is ineffectual. And this message, if you think about it, is just as relevant today, maybe even more so, as it was 2,000 years ago. And true to form, in our reading this morning, James doesn't pull any punches, right? He, he calls it like it is. And, uh, and I believe uh, that this is something that we need to hear. This is a message uh, that we need to receive. James's argument is very clear. He doesn't mix words. Uh, He doesn't beat around the bush. He says, faith without works cannot be called faith. In fact, what he says is, is that faith without works is dead. Real faith, James says, must work. Real faith must produce and bear fruit in the believer's life. In fact, he says, again, that if it does not, that faith is dead. Now, on the surface, and we talked about this in week one, on the surface, it looks like James is comparing faith and works, that he's arguing that one is more important than the other. But, but in reality, what he's doing here is he is contrasting superficial faith, faith that is not the real deal, faith that is not saving faith or biblical faith with uh, the kind of faith that, uh, that we are called to have. So he he calls a question to us. Is my faith the kind of faith that is manifested in my life and pleases God? Or is it a faith that looks similar to real faith on the surface, but in the end is inadequate, ineffectual, empty, or powerless? Now, this has led to all kinds of controversy surrounding the book of James. As recent as the 1500s, the German reformer Martin Luther wrote, St. James' epistle is really an epistle of straw compared to these others, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. We should throw the epistle of James out, for it doesn't amount to much. It contains not a syllable about Christ. Not once does it mention Christ, except at the beginning. Many critics have picked up on this and have argued that James' stance on the relationship between faith and works 
contradicts Paul's writings, which are all about justification by faith alone. But as I said in week one, the difference between Paul and James lies in the fact that Paul attacks the problem of legalism. And what I mean by that is we are justified by our faith in Christ, not by doing the things of the law. James, however, opposes those who feel all you have to do is believe and it doesn't matter how you live. So we have legalism and we have laxity. Both are addressing wrong thinking at either end of the spectrum. For Paul, the question is how genuine faith depends on the finished work of Jesus. A contrast between faith and works. For James, it's, on, it's how one demonstrates that their faith is genuine. A contrast between a living faith and a dead faith. Now, we've already seen how James addresses the possibility of someone who thinks they're a Christian, but who has never had a conversion experienced, who has never allowed God's word to actually change them. James's call to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who he says de deceives themselves, right? We deceive ourselves when God's truth is received on a superficial level so that it never changes or impacts the direction of our life. It, it never changes or impacts our thoughts, our words, our deeds, our decisions, our priorities, our worldview. The philosopher Soren Kierkegaard tells the story of a make-believe country in which only ducks live. And he says, one Sunday morning, all the ducks come into duck church and they waddle down the aisle into their pews and they squat down and the duck preacher takes his place in the pulpit and he, he opens the duck Bible and he quacks, ducks, you have wings and with wings, you can fly like eagles. You can soar high in the sky. And so use your wings, my fellow ducks. Use your wings and fly. And all the ducks quacked, amen and amen. And then they all waddled home together. <laughs> According to James, this goes on in churches all the time. Right? People encountering the truth the Word of God, but not responding to it in a way that changes them, that affects how they live. Can such a faith save anyone, James asks? Jesus addresses the same issue in John 15, 14. He says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And in Luke 6, 46, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say. This anemic faith is the kind of faith that says all the right things. It's the kind of faith that goes to church Sunday after Sunday, runs with the right crowd, but when it comes down to it, when it comes down to the will of God, it just doesn't happen. There are people in church who gather on Sunday mornings and, and say a lot of amens like the ducks in Kierkegaard's story, they agree with Scripture, they agree with the preaching, and then they waddle out the same way they waddled in. I suspect that this has been me on many occasions. But James is very clear. Our lifestyle needs to reflect the reality of our faith. There needs to be a connection. And indeed, throughout his epistle, James integrates true faith an everyday experience, arguing that the proof of the reality of our faith is a changed life. It's a changed life. So this morning, as we look at this section of chapter 2, uh, I want to look at three things that James tells us about real faith. Three things. Number one, he says that real faith connects to real life. Real faith connects to real life. Verse 14 reads, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? 
Now, James is calling on his readers here to reason with him. And he asks two important questions. First of all, he asks, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not show it by your actions? Some translations read, I think it's the King James reads, what does it profit, dear brothers and sisters? And, and the Greek word here is ophileos. And ophileos means furtherance, advantage, help, benefit, gain, and profit. Furtherance, advantage, help, benefit, gain, and profit. In other words, what advantage is there to be gained by saying you believe in God, yet not following His commandments? That's the first question. The second question he asks is this, can that kind of faith save anyone? Now, what he's asking here is not whether works without faith can save us, but whether a dead faith, one which produces no fruit, no change or transformation in our lives, can that kind of a faith save us? Is that faith real? Is it enough to just talk the talk and not walk the walk, some people would say? What do we say about the person who claims to believe the gospel, but whose practice doesn't line up with what he or she claims? How should we regard the spiritual state of someone who claims to be a believer, but, but doesn't live like it? See, what James is doing here is he is challenging his do-little, say-much audience to answer these questions about their daily life and activities. And he's calling them to answer these questions, I believe, in light of a much greater and more important question. And that question is, will I receive the crown of life? Will I receive the crown of life by simply believing in Jesus without allowing that belief to affect my life? Without demonstrating obedience to his word, without living out his truth on a day-to-day -day basis? Now, James doesn't just leave it with a question, right? He fleshes his argument out, and he seeks to prove that faith without obedience can be of no benefit by providing an illustration. Verses 15 and 16 read, Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, Goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So James uh, provides an image of a church member, a brother or sister in Christ, who's starving from lack of food, who's, who's cold because of inadequate clothing, who's suffering. And another member, well aware of that need, responds to that person with a heartfelt wish for his prosperity but without doing anything tangible. He wishes God's peace. He wishes God's wholeness upon his fellow believer, but he doesn't do anything to change the person's situation. And so what might have sounded spiritual was in reality empty. And in fact, James says what was evident here was not that person's faith but that person's hypocrisy. James was reminding us of a theological truth here. There is a profound and fundamental difference between the carnal, fleshy, unregenerated person and one who is a new creation in Christ. So what is that difference? Is that difference church attendance? No. Is that difference orthodox doctrine? No. Is it saying all the right things and standing and kneeling at all the right times? No. I mean, these things are important, but the fundamental issue here is love versus selfishness. Love versus selfishness. To be in Christ is to live out of the Spirit. 
not the flesh. And, and we can only do that through the power of the Spirit, not, not in our own strength. But it's to live out of the Spirit and not the flesh. It's, it's to live out of love and not selfishness. Right? Paul describes what this living is meant to look like throughout his epistles. But, but one, of the, one of the best areas, I think, is in Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 12 to 14, Paul says, Since God chose you to be his holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, right? Above all, clothe yourselves with love, wrap yourselves in love, cover yourselves with love, right? Love responds with compassion from the heart. Love does something practical to help another person. It's not just sentimental feeling. It's, it's not just concern or, or sympathy or, or empathy. It is faith in action. If you think about it, selfishness sacrifices nothing for the other person. Right? It doesn't mind saying nice things. That, that might even make it feel good about itself. But when it comes to doing something, selfishness is all talk and no action. And at the end of the day, it's self-deception. It's self-deception. If I've said nice things, then I've done my duty. Right? If I've said nice things, if I've wished someone well, then I'm good. But that kind of thinking is not true according to James and is not true according to 1 John 3.16. John writes, we know what real love is. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Right? James ends this illustration with a powerful indictment in verse 17. He says, so you see, faith by itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. In other words, there are no signs of spiritual life in the one who claims to hear and believe in Jesus, yet will not put that faith into action. Right? When I tell someone uh, that I need something, right, my hope is that, that I would obtain from them what I would need, right? That, that I would obtain food or, or shelter or clothing. That's what I would want for me. But when someone else tells me what they need and, and I just wish them well, right, all I've done is exercised vain faith. James is telling us here that kind words, best wishes, happy thoughts, good intentions, even the promise of prayer is not enough. Real faith is manifested in tangible deeds. We, we put our money where our mouth is. One preacher put it this way. He said, the people who least live their creeds are the people who shout the loudest about them. The paralysis which affects the arm does not, in these cases, interfere with the tongue. Interesting, isn't it? Those people who live their creeds are the people who shout the loudest about, who least live their creeds, are the people who shout the loudest about them. The paralysis which affects the arm does not, in these cases, affect the tongue. Faith that does not result in some kind of obedience or response to the word of God is lifeless. The law of Christ demands us to love our neighbor. And biblical love is always active. It's always active, not passive. 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7, you know this if you've ever gone to a wedding. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, 
believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Notice all the action words that Paul uses here to describe Christian love. Our love for others should motivate us to do whatever is necessary to lift them out of their distress. Again, John puts it this way. This is 1 John 3, 17 and 18. He says, If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother in, in, or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. But again, John is clear here. If we claim we have faith and it does not lead to obedience and action, it's dead. It's empty. It's fruitless. So ask yourself, how real is your faith? How does your faith connect with real life? with your everyday life. Number two, James says, real faith is more than just an intellectual acceptance of the gospel. It is more than just an intellectual acceptance of the gospel. Verses 18 and 19 reads, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I, by my works, will show you my faith. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. The question that James addresses here is, how does one know if they have real faith? What does it look like? I mean, after all, as he points out, anyone can say, I believe there's a God or, or heaven or hell. James says that although we may even answer with our words, he says it's our actions that speak louder. He says, I, by my works, will show you my faith. In other words, someone may say they are a believer, yet their lifestyle might tell a different story. Scripture is very clear here, and this is one of those parts, I think, where James kind of gets right in your face. Right, he's very clear that to, keep, that, that to not keep God's commandments shows a lack of faith. And, and Jesus put it simply in John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. James goes on here to address the person who believes in Jesus intellectually, in their mind, maybe in their heart, yet doesn't show that faith. The person who doesn't make the time to exercise love towards others. The person who hears the word, but doesn't practice it. The person who maintains a public confession of faith, but isn't willing to live that out in their private life. The person who thinks that just because they believe in the existence of God, that that everything is okay. I mean, after all, they're a good person. James counters this kind of thinking by basically saying, so what? Right? The demons also believe in the existence of God. I mean, think about it. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, what did he do? He quoted Scripture. The demons know there's a God. They know Jesus is who he said it is. The point that James is making here is that the demons may have belief, they may have knowledge, but that's all they have. They do not do the works of God. The difference here between demons, as James is is saying, and Christians isn't just knowledge or belief. The difference is that Christians faithfully submit to the Lordship of Christ in all things. And they become His followers by obeying His commandments and by obeying His Word. Not, not, Not what might be popular in culture, not what the world is doing, but what He says. And they do this by bringing their faith and their works together. Think about it. Faith is abstract. Right? Faith is invisible. 
right? We, we can't see faith per se. It's, it's kind of like the wind. Or you can't see the wind. The only way we know that it's windy is by observing its effects on other things. So when it's windy out, we see the branches of trees, or we see leaves on trees moving back and forth, and, and we see waves and ripples on the water, and, and we see paper blowing down the sidewalk. And, and when it's windy, we, we can feel it caress our face on a warm spring day. But we can't see it with our eyes. And similarly, the only way we can see someone's face is by the effect that it has on their life and on the world around them. And biblical faith will always stimulate people to obey Jesus' command to love in word and deed. As Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Jesus is clear here. Having head knowledge, reciting the creed, memorizing the BCP, doing my own thing, even if it's religious or spiritual, standing up for justice, even when it contravenes God's word, is not enough. Like Jesus, we must do the will of the Father. We must seek with His help to live in obedience. And despite what we might think and despite what the world might tell us, we are not at liberty to just live for ourselves. Right? We were bought for a price. We belong to the Lord, and as such, we need to seek to do what He tells us to do. So ask yourself, how real is your faith? How well do you seek to practice what you preach? And finally, number three, real faith produces change. Real faith produces change. James says in verse 20, how foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Now, James, as I've already said, contrasts here real faith with what he calls useless faith. Uh, the Greek word here is nekros. And nekros means useless, but it also means barren. It also means dead. And it also means corpse. But I think we get the point, right? None of these uh, translations of necros are, are good or desirable, especially when it's describing faith. There are three important things that we need to understand or know about real faith. First of all, real faith is always based on the Word of God, period. Real faith is always based on the Word of God. In Romans 10, 17, Paul says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There is a direct link, right, between hearing faith, hearing the Word of God. You can't, dis you can't uh, distinguish those or separate those. Number two, real faith involves the whole person. The whole person. And what I mean by that is it involves our mind, it involves our emotions, and it involves our will. And that, I think, leads to number three. Because it involves our will, real faith always leads to action, right? A visible response to God's Word and to the hearing of God's Word. Now, James illustrates all of this. He, he illustrates this principle by using two well-known biblical personalities, Abraham and Rahab. Now, if you think about it, there couldn't be two people who are more different Right? Abraham uh, was a Jew, Rahab was a Gentile. Abraham was a godly man, and we're told Rahab was a, a sinful woman. Abraham was the friend of God, R Rahab belonged to the enemies of God. What did they have in common? According to James, both exercised saving faith in God, a saving faith that was visible and manifested through their actions. So James 2, 21 to 24 reads, 
Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that faith was active along with his works, and faith was brought to completion by his works. Thus, the Scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, some of you might be cringing with some of the implications there, so hold the cringe. I'll come back to it in a minute. But basically, um, James is saying that Abraham obeyed God. He obeyed God even when it looked like it would cost him everything. The picture of righteousness that James gives us here is a man who trusted in God so much that he obeyed even when he didn't understand, even when it didn't make sense. And the evidence of Abraham's faith was in his obedience. It wasn't just uh, what was going on in his head. It wasn't just his faith or, or his trust or his belief. It was also physically what he did. Now, James says the same thing about Rahab. Verse 25, Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Now, we looked at Rahab a few weeks ago in our series, Unsung Heroes. So let me just review. Rahab was a resident of the city of Jericho. And when Joshua sent spies into the city to get the lay of the land, they met Rahab and she offers them protection. Even though she was a foreigner, a Canaanite, in doing this, Rahab confirmed that she believed in who the God of Israel was, what he said, what he was going to do. Rahab heard the word and believed. Rahab responded with her mind and her emotions and also with her will, right? She did something about it. She didn't just wish the spies well. She risked her life to protect them. So her mind recognized the truth, her heart was stirred by the truth, and her will acted upon the truth. And like Abraham, she proved her faith by her works, and both were justified. Now let's get back to the cringing. It's very important, I think, that we stop here and make a distinction between the word justification, as Paul uses it, and the word justification as James uses it here. Now, at first glance, it would seem that there's a conflict between what these two writers tell us about the nature of justification. Like Paul says in Romans 3.28, For we hold that as a person is justified by faith apart from works described by, prescribed by the law. Like we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works prescribed by the law. This seems in direct opposition to what James just said. You see that a person is justified by works and not faith alone. But I think these guys are talking about two different things here. Right? Paul is describing how we are justified before God. Right? By faith alone. Salvation, justification before God, being made right with God is all about Jesus' finished work on the cross, right? There's nothing more that we can add to it. James is describing how we are justified before each other. And what I mean by that is we can't see into another person's heart to know what their faith is, right? I don't know what Anne's faith is. I can't see her heart. I can't see her motivations or her mind. But what I can see is the fruit in her life. And that is a sign of faith. Abraham and Rahab were two very different people. They had different backgrounds. They lived a different context. But they had one thing in common. They both demonstrated the authenticity of their faith and proved their belief in God by what they said. By, sorry, by, by how they lived, by, by their actions and by their deeds. James closes this whole chapter in verse 26 by reiterating the necessity of works. He says, just as the body is dead without breath, 
so also faith is dead without works. So you hold a mirror up to someone's mouth. If there's no fog on the glass, they're dead. Just as the body with breath is dead, faith without works is dead. There's, there's no life in it. There's no value to it. The essence of Christianity is transformation. A changed heart, a renewed mind, a reformed life. Real faith regenerates. If it's not changing me into a better version of myself, it's as, at best defective and at worst dead. So we need to ask ourselves, how real is my faith? And how has my faith in Christ changed me? How has it changed the way I think, the way I feel, the way I speak, the way I act, the way I prioritize, the way I view the world around me? In Scripture we read that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. Amen. In other words, we are justified by faith in God's grace. In our belief that Jesus died for our sins, period. Right? As I've already said, there's nothing that we can add to the finished work of Jesus. There's, there's nothing more that we need to do. We can rest in that truth. However, if that belief doesn't change us, if it's not evident in the way we live our lives, if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to take that truth and transform us from the inside out, our faith is dead. It's empty and it's fruitless and ultimately ineffectual. James brings each one of us face to face with an important question this morning. Is the faith that I profess a saving faith? Is it a genuine faith? How do I know if it's the real deal? According to James, we can only know it's real by our lifestyle, by the way we live, by the good works that naturally flow from it. And knowing the danger of self-deception, right? we all know how easily deceived we are by ourselves, knowing the danger of self-deception it's imperative that we all examine our lives to make sure that our faith is genuine, that we are producing the fruit of good works in our lives. Paul ends 2 Corinthians with these words. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. So let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that before the foundation of the universe that you destined us. You destined us to be adopted as your children. We thank you for the precious gift that you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that through His finished work on the cross, we are reconciled to you, and there is nothing more that we need to do. That our salvation is secure. We also recognize, Lord, that you call us to live lives of faith and obedience. And as your masterpiece to do those good works that you planned for each one of us long ago. So, Father, we give your spirit permission this morning to search each one of our hearts, to test our hearts, and to help us know, Lord, how genuine our faith is. Lord, we repent of those times that we have fallen short. And again, we receive your grace and mercy and know that without your Holy Spirit, we are powerless to change or to do anything. And so, Father, we invite you once again to move in and through us, 
and to help us live our lives as you would have us live. That the faith that we pro profess would be evident in the lives we live. That we would practice what we preach and that we would bear much fruit for your glory and for your kingdom. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.